record and then we're going to go to sharing hello everybody i am very pleased to meet you again this afternoon on sunday i'm going to be talking about an interesting topic um, for this week i wanted to talk very exclusively about language learning, language teaching methods, somewhat about curriculum, because advocacy very much is focused on um, reading and, um, I'm sorry, is focused on um, getting the best instruction for the students. That should be your primary focus in advocacy and you do have to advocate for that because a lot of people, and I'm gonna be talking about misunderstanding or misconception or simply unwilling to change because the facts don't fit some of the uh, stereotypes people have. So let me go through some of these right now. Uh, the first one is first and second language acquisition. This is an old video or an old PowerPoint, but the, the essential points uh, are no different. I wanted to talk a little bit about where things came from. People believed back in the 50s under B.F. Skinner that we learn language pretty much how a rat would learn how to find cheese in a maze, that they do it over and over and they get stimulated by the reward of the cheese and therefore they figure out how to maneuver the maze. Um, that is not how language is learned, but that's what a lot of people thought. That's been disproven. And then we got uh, a nativist, which in some ways was, uh, nativist is usually a negative term. It, it infers that you pick it up as a language, as uh, within your culture, and it's just a natural function of living here. Uh, and it has a lot to do with assimilation, so that people are, they, the more they become like us, the more they get our language, okay? They do get your language, but uh, they don't have to compromise their internal identity to do that. Um, and then the, the man Chomsky and Crash in here are very important. Uh, Chomsky came up with the idea that the human brain essentially has a set of neurons unique to us as a species. That's questionable, but at least that we have a capability of picking up and using language. We don't know when this evolved or what time, obviously it's been hundreds of thousands of years, but we know that language did evolve because we can go back to written language 5,000 years ago. And we know that people spoke for many, many, many thousands of 100,000 years before that. Um, so Chomsky said it's called an LAD, language acquisition device and that we are naturally, when we're born, there's a window when uh, the brain is activated. Obviously, if you can see your brain, the visual parts activated, but also your ability to learn language is linked to that. And Krashen is going to be the guy that really revolutionizes, among others, revolutionizes a language, a, a teaching, and how we learn. The behaviorist theory you thought we were born like a blank slate. You may have heard that from uh, Rousseau, uh, I believe that was Rousseau or John Locke, the child is a bl blank slate and we fill it up with whatever we fill it up with. And even behaviorists said, well, we fill them up. We, we teach them how to eat by rewarding good behavior on how to hold a spoon and punishing bad behavior or, or whatever. And that's, that's a very mecha mechanistic approach. Uh, children and acquisition of language is not just a matter of doing some tricks like you might teach a horse. Functionalist is an important theory and it grows out of uh, that social interaction is the basis for the development of language. Our caregivers, that's a lot of times when we do the uh, uh, home language survey that the parent's language or the caregiver's language. If someone's cared for, I had a friend once that their caregiver spoke Portuguese and they spoke English and Spanish. So the kids grew up, they, 
they, they knew a lot of Portuguese and they knew, uh, of course, Spanish and they also knew English. So they knew three languages right out of the, right the get go. So functionalism is, is how we function in society. It's how we, um, language, second language theory uh, corresponds in some ways. Um, if you believe that we are behaviorists, then you believed in teaching language like repeat after me, I'm gonna reinforce it, I'm gonna give you a, a lollipop if you do the assignment correctly, or I'm gonna have you imitate me. I've got some examples on the video. You're gonna see something from, uh, from the old movie, um, uh, The Dead Poets Society, and it shows a guy teaching Latin and repeat after me and does the conjugations. I'm sure some of you did this in your ESL classes or in your Spanish where you repeated, yo soy tu eres el es, ellos, uh, nosotros uh, son, somos, ustedes son. And so you'd repeat that, so you got them. I remember I did that too. But as I mentioned, my, my Spanish classes were very well taught, so I did quite well. Um, now, another thing, uh, the nativist is, believes that you get the second language very similar to the first language with comprehensible input. Now, to some extent, that is true. That's very true. Uh, so you want, to, you want to consider that, that you want comprehensible input. Now, one of the earliest uh, approaches to ESL, I remember in the 80s, is the big thing was comprehensible input. So if you're learning a language, you don't want people making you practice things that are absurd, like the pencil is red, el lapis is rojo. And uh, that's kind of silly, because who talks about pencils? That's not a normal language. You're more, much more likely, the pancakes are ready. Oh, the pancakes are wonderful. You know, something like that. I'm hungry, so I'm thinking pancakes right now. And the fun functionalist was language acquisition was as comprehensible input, plus interaction with other people and negotiating meeting, meaning, which means when you learn vocabulary, you may not learn it correctly. You may hear, you know, first time you heard about rap music, you may have thought, oh, rapping on the table or something. It's not that at all. It's, you, you know, might have been some mention of rap, but not in that sense. And then people use the term rap about the way they did their music. And that started, I remember reading last night about the first rap music. I can't remember the guy, but it's back in the 70s or late 60s. And it was like the first rap album. The guy was like, you know, and people thought it was very odd. Why would anybody like that for music? Now, of course, it's huge. Um, second language teaching methods, and this is one of my faves. Um, there are four big areas. Now, you'll notice the communicative, that takes into account total physical response, um, somewhat the nativist approach, um, but comprehensible input. In other words, communication, interaction language within a context that's that's the ball game right there but we started out with grammar translation back in the age a long time ago back in egyptian times and the greeks people studied language formally by grammar and by repeat after me and copying down things and many countries still do this um, i had a friend that taught in china many years ago and they were required to literally in the class, and you couldn't change this. You could walk in and be a guest lecturer or teach in China, but you had to go through and translate line by line paragraphs in English. And, our, and, and they would translate it so they knew what it said and they'd look up things in dictionaries and stuff. And that was how you did your lesson. You just simply got a book and you went through and. And then gradually they've been improving, improving approaches and that, that helped to some extent. But that grammar translation is very, is not useless, but it's not useful for conversational language. 
because nobody wants to learn a language if they can't actually go out and use it. You know, what's the use of studying French if you can't even order your dinner? Or you can't talk to anyone, or you can't even say more than hello, goodbye, you know. Uh, so grammar translation is the old, old approach, and it is still strong. I still see incompetent language teachers and even ESL. They, we're going to translate. We're going to grammar translate. Now, you may like it. I don't like it. I think it has some use occasionally. It just depends on the situation. Uh, direct or the Berlitz method. Don't worry too much about Berlitz. It's a company that taught language. But this method was you're exposed directly to the language and you directly teach it to people. You know, this is how you say this, this, how you, and it was pretty successful. And it was a basis for a lot of language schools in Europe in the early 1900s. People go there and uh, Berlitz was a company and they would teach, uh, teach a German, teach a French, usually it was French. Um, now, that's not a method. I mean, we still use direct instruction to some of what we do, of course we do. You know, we'll say, oh, that's because the direct object goes in front of the other one. We explain that, but that's not the basis. Grammar rules are not the basis. Um, now, audiolingual, and I'm just kind of skipping through these, but the audiolingual was an attempt to mass teach languages after World War II. People would have big language labs and they would have a video, they would have uh, earphones and everything there was no video it was audio tape and you literally would have someone say something and you'd repeat it back they record it and they grade you on it so it was not not very good for feedback um, and what they wanted to do was mass teaching and this was a lot of times it was used by uh, military and CIA and groups like that and also used in and I saw language labs as late as the uh, 1980s in Oklahoma State. Um, but they had the old, you know, and what happens is this, you put on the earphones and you have this voice come on and say it's something to you and you'd repeat it back or you just listen to it and you'd fall asleep because you'd sit there for an hour in a monotone. And the fact is that language is a visual has a visual element, you have to see people. It has to be interactive. Uh, audiolingual is worse than direct, I think. I mean, and people, you'd buy all these tapes. It used to be, oh, you're going to learn French and you'd buy, you'd pay, you know, $200 and buy all these tapes. And then sometimes it was videotapes, which were somewhat better. And, um, sorry, three students. And then, so you'd watch, uh, you know, you do the audiolingual. We don't do those anymore, my God, help us. Uh, communicative, now communicative is gonna be everything that comes after. It's gonna to be total physical response. It's going to be something unusual called the Rossius method from Dartmouth University. I actually stuck that in there just so you could see it. It's kind of like using drama and direct conversation in a very intense way, but most people can't do it. But the communicative approach is there's always a context. You vary the stimulus so that students get up and they move around. You can do TPR. And I like a combination of those that in effect reflects what life is like. Like you have your class set up and you do a, you do like ordering at the restaurant and people rehearse it and they, then they actually do it. And then they get to implement it. And hopefully you get situations if you were taking studying French in France, you could literally uh, go out and imp you could use the language you were learning. And that's one advantage ESL students have here. They can go out and use the English they learn in the classroom, conversational English if necessary, in, uh, in, their, uh, in their classes. I mean, in, their, in real life. Okay, now, what do we know? We know that children learn language unconsciously. There is something called a universal grammar, or however you call it, neurons, however, that children, barring any kind of issue with 
abilities or some some situation uh, they that we know that they learn a language they will naturally learn a language they're not going to fail to learn a language a child's errors indicate learning is taking place so errors are not to be jumped on and people ripped for them so that's a big mistake it used to be grammar translation and audio lingual their attitude about errors is we're going to try to suppress them right out of the get-go we're not going to have errors errors are useful you know and you know when children learn to speak they sometimes either in their their pronunciation or maybe in they overgeneralize and they they use the plural on everything when they shouldn't and then they, that corrects as they get older as they're exposed to more language and they correct it children learn language in a meaningful and supportive communicative setting just imagine if you could learn french by having somebody not treat you like a child but someone very calmly to spend time with you and you listen to french because this is a huge issue listening is comes first listening always comes first it's really un, unfortunate that we get in these classes where the people expect you to start producing a language within a couple of days i understand we can't wait two months while you're in french class for you to ever say anything but it is critical um, to find situations and sources so the person learning a language is exposed to it i happen to like french in action that's an old video but it's a really nice video series i find television useful too radio not so much because you can't see it but i like i've heard people say they've learned english by watching soap operas because they get very involved and they want to know more about what's happening you know and sometimes they use subtitles of course you got to be careful subtitles sometimes are totally wrong and ridiculous children uh okay they learn language in a meaningful way children understand more than they can say this is very critical people don't un they, when they see a child understand something then they expect for them to be able to produce the language and they can't always do that but you have nonverbal clues and etc so those are now why am i telling you all this okay oh by the way children take a lot of time to become fluent duh even a child takes years to become fairly fluent in language and uh, they're always learning so when someone expects an esl student they say well they're not very fluent yet that's going to take years um, some individuals are much better than others but you got to have reasonable expectations um, okay now i'm telling you all this because you need to explain this to people that don't understand why ESL e English learners aren't making progress fast enough. Now, some of this is too complex to explain. I don't mean they're not able to understand it, but I mean, you know, when you try to get a basic message across, you don't want to you don't want to confuse them with enough details that they don't learn anything. So a lot of times I would use the example of a child learning a language and that even though you're 12 years old, you actually are more, in some ways, and you're, you're not as free to listen and to learn. You're more self-conscious because little kids, they just hear stuff. They just constantly soak in information. But when you get to be eight or nine years old, you're self-conscious. And sometimes you're fearful to, to, to ask questions. You're fearful to get too involved. And so it's very critical that the what's what is often called the um, the filter that you literally put up a shield to block things, and that's why people don't learn language. They just say, "Oh, it's all noise. I don't understand." They turn off, and unless they're active listening, they won't be able to pick up certain pieces of language that they could learn. You know, when I learn somebody speaking German, I can still hear words that I say, well, I think that's like English. And so I'll hear things. That gives me, it's like filling in a puzzle. You get so much of the puzzle and you continue to get more of the puzzle. You just don't pick it up immediately. 
Okay, what are the differences? Now, this is usually an exercise I have with people. I don't, uh, you can fill it in. Usually the first language is learned at home, which means the second language is learned at school. It's learned by young children. Second language is usually learned by older children or adults. It's learned to communicate with loved ones. Well, that means it's a pleasant thing to learn a language, but with second language is usually learned to go to school or communicate with fellow workers or to fulfill a requirement. And so it's not, it doesn't, you know, it's not a, a love affair learning, uh, learning um, German if you have to learn it for your job or something, it's just work. It's an unconscious process. Now, I believe my theory on this is that learning a second language is very unconscious too. But a lot of people want to analyze, they have this desire to analyze the language and to mentally memorize and remember all the structures. That's not bad. That is a preference of a lot of people. But I also like the idea, and I'll talk about it when we talk about different ways of teaching, is that I like the idea of just listening to French. I like the, the French in action videos. I love to watch it. It's like a soap opera, more or less, but it's beautifully done. It's slowly paced, but it's still not artificial. It's not fake. People are actually speaking French in a context. Okay, so you have to think about your lessons for your ESL kids. Are you having them learn things that are going to be important academically or, you know, uh, or in conversation, you know, and are you giving them context? Context is always big. That's, that's what's related to communicative. Uh, total physical response is, uh, it's people see you doing a certain action movement and they say, oh, I can connect to that. So they have, they see it. Now that's still conscious, it's conscious, but some of it's unconscious. And you can usually tell when people are kind of excited and say, well, this is fun. You know, you don't sit around thinking fun. You're not just sitting there memorizing. Uh, no time pressure to learn. Now there is pressure to learn teaching ESL. I know that, but it would be, you want to make the, you want the what's called the filter, the affective filter, which is you want students to be relaxed so they're not afraid to make mistakes and to try to do things correctly. It should be fun. It should be pleasant. It's not, uh, learning a language is work, but if you make it unpleasant work, if there's no pleasure with it, I don't see work as being a negative thing by itself. You, you have to make, I don't care if it's games, I don't care if it's, um, if it's you're teaching with a movie and there should be laughter and relaxation as part of it. And of course you have to learn developmental concepts as well as language. A lot of times a little kid is going to learn all the physical things, you know, running, don't run in the house. He's going to learn things about, you know, how to conduct himself, um, things that a child is expected to physically do and then also you know not, not run in the street and and how to behave not hit other people all those rules about culture um you learn those in the second language too and some of those you it's better to learn them by being in the culture and by being in the target language which eso kids are in the target culture so there really is an advantage learning English in the United States or any other English language program or a English country like that. Okay, here's the key. And this is from an older book, but it's basically the same thing as Crashing. Comprehensible input, interactive. You sh your instruction has to be somewhat intellectually challenging. You should move on from, you know, it shouldn't be so boring that it's repetitive and the kids don't really see a point in it. Um, obviously some students, I like mixed groups because then you take advantage of those that are more advanced and they become models for students that may be struggling. And particularly they might be able to explain it to it in their own language. Why, why is this, um, 
why do you say this in English? And they might explain, they may not know the grammar, but they can at least give the model of it. Uh, it should be cross-cultural. And this is the other aspect of advocacy is obviously openness to other cultures and understanding them. If I have an ESL class and I have students from Africa that have a different religion, a different background, totally different from Chinese students or from Indian students. Well, Indian students usually already know English, but, but I should make an effort to take advantage of all that new stuff out there so they can learn about other cultures, okay? Um, instruction should promote both language in terms of speaking and listening, reading and writing. I believe that all four of those should be in every lesson in different manner, you know, different percentages. You may not have much writing, but maybe you write down a couple of words from a basically a conversational lesson, or you have something they have to read on a menu and they have to they have to go through and conversationally form what they want to do in order to order the food. Or if you're having them fill out an application and they get an application that says, you know, and you have a model there, you know, what are your skills? What do you know how to do? Uh, tell something about yourself, things like that. So you, you always want to have, it's very important to have a model. You don't want them to copy word for word, but you want them to have a pattern. I like the idea of a pattern, but it's not complete. It forces them to add add in some of their own sentences. It's just, you know, you've got to leave something for them to create on their own to invent so that they're extending themselves. Okay, the goal of instruction should be an ac achievement of academic standards, of course. We're in, if we're teaching school, we're not just teaching English for tourism purposes. So we want to increase comprehensibility, increased interaction, and we want to engage the intellect. So if you're teaching a math class in context, uh, with a context, maybe it's business math or maybe it's algebra and you're applying it to a, a practical situation like, I don't know, work, load of work or something, could be in a physics lesson. Um, you want them to look at a word problem. You want them to be able to break down the word problem. They may have to read it aloud and explain it and analyze it, but you want it to be a, comp I like the idea of the holistic approach that language has four modes, you know, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And uh, so you want to promote the intellectual mode as well. Now, uh, why do you integrate language and content instruction? Well, I want to jump ahead a little bit to something that's not in this particular PowerPoint, but the PSYOP uh, is an approach that's very well researched and you'll be able to, I put a ton of stuff on this page, so you'll be able to go and look at a lot of videos. I realize you can't do all of them, but you'll be exposed to them. I'm not going to mandate you watch 10 hours of videos every week, but uh, if you're interested in talking about this, uh, with, I mean, thinking about this, the PSYOP approach integrates language and content because you literally write objectives for language and you write objectives for content. What's the content? Students will, uh, maybe students will uh, design a roadmap for the Oregon Trail or students will create a nutritional based on 1840s they will create a supply a list of supplies or maybe even cook so you can have activities tbr they will have a list of supplies and they will actually cook some meals that would have been served on the oregon trail okay i, I don't think it'd be roadkill they go too slow for roadkill but they might have shot a few wild animals that might not be too appealing to you right now. Rabbit or squirrel or, I don't think they eat snake, but you never know. Um, so what, uh, so that would be content instruction. Now, what what is the language instruction? Well, in SIOP they say, okay, you will give a presentation. You will speak about 
how you will give a, 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 a cooking lesson where you actually cook the food and you will talk about the amount you will talk you will use all the vocabulary to boil or to fry or whatever you're going to do got a little flour with you you're trying to spare it so you don't want to you know pancakes served every day wouldn't be an option nobody had it probably didn't have a dairy cow with them you know going across the plains with a dairy but uh so this is going to pr promote cognitive development it's going to be motivating it's going to be fun to watch it's going to be entertaining and it's a good way to learn language. Now, here's another big part, and uh, it's called Bix and Calps, or Bix is Basic Interpersonal Communication Skills, which is social English. You can call it whatever you want, street English, conversational English, but it's not academic. It's not writing paragraphs. It's not writing research papers. It's not doing a formal speech on a topic. It is a social language, playground English, simple sentences. Uh, most people, you know, especially when they're younger, but you don't, you don't speak a sentence that you might write that's really long, like 20, sentence, 20 words long. Most of your social language is gonna be little bits and pieces, everything from hello, how are you, even nonverbal sounds, grunting, whatever, like the guy on tool time, face-to-face, um, -face, small number of people. Um, you're not too precise, people can ask, and they say, well, I don't understand, what do you mean? How do you, how do you fold to make origami or something? And they just show it to you. They may not know all the words, but they can demonstrate it. And it's usually familiar topics. Do you like her? Oh, I like her fine. Or, oh, is that your boyfriend over there? Gossip is always good for this. It's social language, okay? Now, um, so we have social language, and then we want to talk about, um, I thought I put this on there, maybe I didn't. Academic language. And what is academic language? Academic language is what you're teaching in school. Reading in textbooks, reading in books per, per se. It shouldn't be boring in any way, but you should promote reading. You should, casual reading is huge. Krashen is a big believer in free voluntary reading, which means you should encourage your students. You should have library books. You should have books that are dual language, bilingual. To where the, the kids could, and I've shared this with people in my other classes, people should have a book that the parents could read it in Spanish or you could read it in English in school. So the kids could read even in their own language. Now, unfortunately, it's almost always going to be Spanish and English, not the other languages. But there are books in Arabic you could get in Arabic and English. It's just going to be tougher to get those. But you can't get it in all languages. You know, obviously Chinese is going to be fairly common in Japanese. Now, uh, the problem or the issue with academic language is it's you need to be precise. You need to spell. It needs to be it needs to be well organized. It it has to be of a higher order of comprehensibility because you you're not there in person. People have to. They have to understand you by just reading what you've written in a letter. You're not there with the letter to act it out for them. You know, there is no total physical response to your to your letter to a company complaining they sold you something that doesn't work. Um, so it's more there are fewer clues, and the clues that are there require greater precision in using the language. It's going to be, uh, you have to clarify things. It's gonna put more, more stress. Okay, now, here's something, I don't have it on this particular one, but I wanted to uh, explain the big deal. The big deal is that academic language, listening and speaking, you know, the BICs, the simple social English, most of you probably know this, but you, you can learn it and be fairly fluent as little as six months or a couple of years, depending on your age, but also depending on your intent and your openness to language learning. Don't ever say an older person can't learn another language. That's not true. 
uh, your brain doesn't shut down unless you choose to shut it down. Because a lot of people, because of their ego and stubbornness, they block new learning. Now, academic English, academic language in any, is, may take five to six, seven, eight years. It depends on how much the student learns, how quickly they adapt, and do they study, and are they engaged. So if you want to improve, now I'm going to tell you the bottom line on this. If you want to improve writing, you've got to get your students to read. Reading is the key to writing. Once the patterns are recorded and the student, good readers are able to write. You can almost bet on that every time. A good reader is going to be a good writer. They may need practice, but they have the patterns. They have the patterns. It's, it's the same as listening to music and you practice music once in a while and then you go on American, America's Got Talent and somebody does an incredible job and they say, well, how could that be? I said, well, they practiced a lot. You know, they, 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 they listen because you, first of all, you can't produce a sound if you can't hear it. So if we're learning Arabic or something and they have a sound that's not in English, you're, First time you hear it, you may say, I don't even know what that is. I tried to listen to Somali online and I heard sounds in Somali. I, I, could, not, I could not break down a single word. I'd need an actual very structured uh, lesson plans and units to help me learn Somali. You just don't pick it up. It's not the same. When, when the language is different, whether it's Chinese or or, you know, in some languages, the written is very hard because it's not the same script. In other languages, I've had a few unusual situations where I had Japanese students that were much better at writing than they were at speaking. And that's because they, they had a great precision. They could read and write in English, but their pronunciation and their practice was very behind. And that's kind of the reverse of what you normally find. Okay, I, I wanted to hit this part first. I'm going to do another video later, maybe tomorrow for you, okay? I'm going to try to bring myself back on here, and I think